Hello. Hello. Is this thing on? Oh, hey, can we at least get some light over here? What? Oh, God, for fuck's sake. We've squeezed the clouds dry, she tells them. She uses the language of the ancients because the scientists are all gone and dead. She's the last one. But they don't care for the ancients any more than they cared for the scientists. They sent her home with a cardboard box, her coffee mug, a photo. That's when she begins hiding the bottles under the floorboards. Twelve bottles per day, stockpiling before the hoarding begins because she knows it will begin. Different stores every day, different times. She carries them in her backpack up six flights of stairs. Her thighs harden. Enough bottles for one year. It's optimistic. She doesn't expect to be alive in a year. Once the water is gone, it won't come back. Everything burns. Day 31. The last day. Four hours of searching. One bottle shouldn't matter, and yet it matters in the moment. A lifeline, a level to be unlocked, and then at dusk she finds it. She raises the blue glass in a salute to the fading world, tips it, sending the water roiling, a sea she has yet to sail. She places the bottle in the bag that hangs behind the door, the one packed for leaving. Because you never know what is coming for you, and if you wait until you are told to go, then it is already too late. Beneath her feet, a door slams. An armchair slides across the floor. Glass breaks, the familiar sound of bleeding. In lockdown, not all cages are the same. Beyond the window, clouds crackle, spitting shards of light into the ground. She watches them slide dry into the sunset. Now that she is secure, she can admit that here she is no longer safe. Perhaps she never was. There is only one place she knows of where the wells are deep, hidden in a mountain's embrace. But to find them is to leave this world behind. She closes her eyes and opens her hands, letting the threads of her life spool at her feet. She thought she had knitted them fast, but now everything unravels. Sometimes you must cut free your own threads and weave them into the hands of another. She sleeps, curled in the middle of the living room floor, on the purple carpet the previous tenants left behind. You can keep it, they said. She rolls into the smell of them. Pizza and semen and cat piss. This is what she will remember. This is what will keep her safe. To have a home, a true home is to drive a stake into the ground and tether your heart. The rope is never long enough. You run, never knowing how far you can go before the knot draws tight and the edges shear off strips of bloody muscle. With the first scratches of dawn, she lets herself into the downstairs apartment. She places a hand over the woman's mouth, holding her steady. The woman rolls her head towards the form sleeping beside her and nods. One holds the pillow, the other sits on his chest. It takes four minutes. They wait another five, then roll him onto his side, one hand beneath his cheek, the other against his chest. The sheet loosened at his shoulder, hair tousled the way it was the night they made their first baby, back when the woman thought loving him was still possible. Afterwards, she leads the woman upstairs and shows her the floorboards and how the wallpaper peels away. Now that he is gone, the woman may survive. Better, though, to have water as well as hope. She knows she should leave. She also knows gifts should come in threes. She smooths her hand across the woman's cheek, kissing the scar, the bruises, the burns. Her hands brush thighs, the small of the woman's back, her shoulder blades, 
tracing the roadmap of a broken marriage. Her hand is on the woman's mouth, parting her lips to make space for the gasp of air to escape. She catches it between her teeth and swallows it down. And in the moment between darkness and dawn, she breathes life back into the woman's body. She knows nothing about what the apocalypse will bring, but she knows that no one should die with the lingering memory of a monster's hand on their skin. The sun skips along fence posts and water bottles hammer against her spine as she runs the cobblestones. Twelve bottles, eleven plastic, one blue glass. If she's careful, they might last her a month. Welcome! Welcome! Oh, it's so good to see you all here tonight. Hi! <laughs> this feels like such a rare gift. Although, um, I don't know, is it a gift? Should we be worried that we've reached the point where nobody even bothers trying to keep their distance anymore? <laughs> but hey, let's try to see the positives, right? We are all back together, and that's its own kind of special, don't you think? I'll, um, I'll confess, I've been struggling to come up with a title for tonight's talk. I mean, there's so much to cover, and uh, where to start, hmm? Post-apocalyptic sex, a case study. How to reach orgasm in the shadow of a crumbling civilization. Uh, maintaining focus while getting laid in the backseat of a burnt-out limousine while nearby zombies climb the scaffolding of a long-abandoned... Do I sound glib? It feels glib. Flippant. Insensitive. But will I be judged more harshly for transposing the cruel reality of a post-apocalyptic wasteland into a mere contextual framework for the ongoing hunt for that most elusive of creatures, the multiple orgasm? Or am I doing a disservice to the very act of intimacy itself by constantly bringing it up in the context of the situation in which we now find ourselves? Well, goddammit, why shouldn't I juxtapose sex and the decline of the capitalist military-industrial complex? <laughs> to be honest, it's a wonder I'm having sex at all with lines like that. <laughs> Hi, I'm, um, I'm currently grappling with the notion of physical intimacy at the crossroads of civil disobedience and structural collapse. Wanna fuck? Although... As an aside, can I just say that there is a bittersweet irony in discovering that post-apocalyptic sex is the best sex I've ever had? <laughs> oh, I know, I know, too much information, right? But um, here we are. And uh, let's be honest, I never set out to become that girl, right? The one who everybody talks about in hushed tones. The, the one who doesn't seem to have fully come to terms with reality. The one who everybody sidles up to to ask for advice. And really, that's why we're all here tonight, isn't it? To get answers to those big questions, to the things that matter most as we plummet headfirst towards the end of days. <laughs> all right, well, here you go. Got a working uterus? Get yourself an IUD. Nope, no, really, that's it. That's my advice. I mean, come on, nobody wants to be upstairs wondering whether or not they're pregnant while downstairs the zombies are shredding the paintwork and eating the cat. <laughs> I mean, science may not have served us well in the last days of our crumbling civilization, but IUDs have come a long way. I mean, nowadays, those things will last you 10 years or a lifetime, whichever comes first. What? Sorry? STIs? Oh, <laughs> honey, have you ever stopped to think about what the acid rain is doing to you? <laughs> yeah. As you can see, I'm a fun girl to have at a party. He wrote the manifesto on the back of the coasters he found in the bar on the corner of Maple and Blythe. She found him in a bar that wasn't on the corner of anything. It was an accident she has come to regret. There need to be rules, he said. 
I need you to understand things. At first, she thinks he means things you cling to, things you remember even when you don't want to, or maybe even things that drag you forward on those days when you'd rather quit. While she waits for him to continue, she thinks, I'm not sure I want rules. The only thing I want is an all-access pass to the darkest corners of your heart. But she doesn't say it, because she knows he's afraid of the darkness. They waste candles burning away the shadows. She wants to tell him that she longs to run her hands over the walls he has built within. To find her way into the corridors he swears lead towards nothing, but she doesn't. Nor does she tell him what digging through rubble has taught her. She doesn't tell him how she excavates after he sleeps, one hand on his chest, eyes closed, toes on the threshold. Paragraph 2, subsection 1, rules of engagement, he says. For a second, she thinks he means the other sort of engagement. But no. Paragraph 2, subsection 1, details how they will fight. They begin there. He begins there. Paragraph 1 is nothing more than an overview, how it came to be. Paragraph 2 is nuts and bolts, the nitty-gritty, the pain. I will hurt you, he says in conclusion. My words will cut your skin and you will bleed tears. When people tell you who they are, you should believe them, or you are a fool. He wanders off then, leaving the coasters on the table his confessions of a future crime that somehow she is responsible for committing. She files them in the recipe box she found in the cupboard above the sink. She knows deep down that manifestos deserve better, but it's all she has. She slides his fears between recipes for pineapple chicken and for profiteroles. Sweet. Bitter sweet. Recipes for a post-apocalyptic palate. I mean, really, after all we've been through together, you'd think there'd have been some sort of shift, right? That in the midst of all of this looting and destruction, a few of the old barriers would have been torn down. That we'd have climbed a few fences, scaled a few walls, stormed a few barricades, or, I don't know, whatever metaphor for crossing immovable obstacles you consider appropriate. Except, uh, we haven't, have we? Just up the road, the third wave of reinforcements is laying siege to the Parliament, and here we are, all knee-deep in corpses, rules, and good old-fashioned fears. Take camo, for instance, right? Now, I know it absorbs a whole lot of brain matter, but does it really make your thighs invisible? Because that's what we worry about, right? I mean, which we shouldn't, but we do. It's bred into us. I mean, practically, from the moment we're out of the womb, we're being told we will never find a man unless we get our thighs under control. I mean, uh, credit where credit is due, though. Military-issue pants have the best pockets, right? I mean, I know we wiped 463 species off the planet in the space of a single weekend, but finally, finally, we have trousers with halfway decent pockets, right? I mean, no, don't get me wrong. I know that rampant militarization of an otherwise non-confrontational society is obviously a bad thing, but hey, at least we have pockets. <laughs> Can you believe it? I mean, it only took a, a global pandemic, three locust plagues, a global water shortage, and what else? Some um, flesh-eating bacteria and a volcanic eruption that blacked out the sky for women to be allowed to have pants with halfway decent pockets, but... Uh, I suppose you expect us to be grateful now, hmm? He presses his palm against the stones, soaking in the baking heat of the day. She slips her thumb underneath his hand, working against his resistance. He pretends not to notice. He has the manifesto wrapped in a sheet of bubble wrap. Sometimes when she's awake, Alone in the darkness, she reaches her hand into his bag and pops a bubble out of spite. The day before, he found the recipe box, hidden in the sweating recess of the refrigerator behind what she assumed was once a leg of lamb. She wanted to leave it there, the manifesto and the lamb, lock the door and leave. 
Locked away, locked up, locked down, locked in, locked out. So many locks on basements, on attics, locks, bolts, keys. She wonders how she found herself with a man who locks away everything she craves. In the darkness, he turns away from her, curling towards the fire, the last flicker of light comforting him in a way she never can. She waits until he is fully asleep, when the breath has settled deep into his chest. Then she runs her fingernail down the full length of his spine, barely brushing the skin. He is angry before he is fully awake. She notices she no longer cares. When he sleeps again, she slides an unused coaster from his bag. She writes in her neat script, the one praised by teachers and birthday card recipients alike, paragraph two, subsection three, rules for forgiveness. She scratches out the words. She clicks the pen nib in and out, in and out, in and out. She writes, I would rather be alone than be invisible. She wraps the coaster in the bubble wrap and tucks it back into place. She laces her boots and she leaves. Can we talk anatomy for a minute? Women's anatomy, would that be awkward? I mean, is it just me, or is anyone else curious about the fact that exploration parties have pawed across the entire planet, both pre- and post-apocalypse? They've waded through sand and snow and swamp since the beginning of time, since the days when empire and pith helmets were in vogue. Years, I tell you, years spent exploring the globe, and yet it seems that so many are still at a loss when it comes to exploration closer to home. This, then, is my second piece of advice, because time is running out. We must lead the expeditionary forces. We must hold the flashlights, hmm? paint large red crosses on the maps. We must cry out, here be dragons, sweet, mystical, fire-breathing dragons that will eat you alive. Choose your expeditionary force carefully. Though, the last thing any of us need is another Livingston standing atop a waterfall that the locals have known for centuries and naming it for a foreign queen. People like that only want to conquer lands and then claim them for their own. Better to muster an expeditionary force as interested in the journey as the destination. Seek out those who will ask for directions, who will seek local wisdom, be guided through the forest. I'm sorry, are you confused? Euphemisms. So many fucking euphemisms, complicated, elaborate euphemisms designed to obfuscate and misdirect even the most dedicated seeker, because yes, even now, it's hard to be honest and say what we really want. Yes, there. No, stop. Go back. Radical honesty lies atop the farthest mountain. Always over the next rise. Always just out of reach. This one is different. He sits, watching her collect the coasters. She appreciates the silence, the way he holds space as she makes her way around the deserted bar, a place where they found themselves together. She slides the coasters one by one into the gaps, shoring up the tables as if she can somehow make things right after the fact. Healing flows back as well as forward, she tells him. Seven generations in each direction. She slides a coaster for her father, for her grandfather, for all those who came before. He slides the splinter from her finger without question, without a word. She sees the hesitation, though, before he lets go of her hand. And for the first time since they met, she thinks about how it will be when they part. 
He was sitting on the fence, three miles out of town, waiting to meet her. His sister had told him she'd be there. Have I met your sister, she asked. No. And yet she knew I'd be here. He nods. Yes. Today? Just here, not when. How long have you been waiting? As long as it takes. That doesn't make any sense, she says. Does anything? Where is your sister now, she asks. Safe. So, back to orgasms. Who here has faked an orgasm? Show of hands. I, maybe that's a stupid question. Who here hasn't faked an orgasm? <laughs> oh, come on. We've all done it. You know, you're tired. You just want it to be over with. You were ready 15 minutes ago, and then the moment passed, and now you're... Or more likely, you heard your phone beep in the other room, so you're all up in your head wondering who it was, and what, well... Oh, yes, yes, I know I'm showing my age. But we haven't had phones since 2025. Uh, Phones aside, right? Women are trained to be polite. You're lying there, spread-eagled, exposed to the entire world. And for a moment, there's a part of your brain that dares to think, would it be rude to ask maybe if... Because it would be awesome if you would just... But then the other part crashes in, right? The voice that's desperate to avoid confrontation. Oh, I see. You're already done. Oh, no, it, it doesn't really matter. No, 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 never mind. And so we pretend that we're happy, fulfilled, impressed. Do you ever wonder, though, if you're doing it right... You know, like if you're capturing the essence of a fake orgasm, one that is uniquely you, because let's be honest, whoever takes time in the moment of the real thing to contemplate the details, right? Like, how is my head tilting? Breathing? Deep or shallow? Eyes open or closed? Where is the gasp? Is there a gasp? (laughs) Here's the thing I worry about. What if our fake orgasms are better than the real thing? Just think about that for a moment, right? Like, what if you're lying there and your partner is watching you in the throes of genuine ecstasy and they're thinking, where's the gasp? I hate it when she fakes. And there you are, bathed in sweat with a melted brain and in love with the entire world. And your partner is lying there, staring at the ceiling, obsessing over the missing gasp. The moral of this story, then, is to fake it But not too well, right? Don't go overboard. Clench, bite, groan, but save the gasp. (gasps) Did you see that? The entreaty? Even now it's all about the cell, right? Capitalism has destroyed us all, and yet here we are, still trading away our bodies, still worried about the transactions. (laughs) Of course, the customer is always right, because of course there is always a customer. I do you, you owe me. Don't oversell, don't undersell, don't disappoint. Can I pay with exposure? Can I get it for free? But then, then there's that one who looks you in the eye, right? The one who always holds your gaze, the one who would know if you were faking. The one who, just when you're ready to do the gasp and be done with it, does that thing. You know, that thing, that thing that you thought was a one-off, just like a first-time thing, a thing that would never happen again. And then that person does that thing. And you've never felt so seen, so transparent, so utterly lost. He heard the stories long before he met her. Stories about the woman who follows the clouds. The woman who travels alone. You can't protect her, they told him. He swore he wouldn't try. 
I don't want to lose you. The words float above his head in a way that makes him wonder if they are his at all. He reaches out, trying to pull them back in. I don't want to be lost, she says. He doesn't know what that means. He waits for her to move, to roll over, to punctuate the end of something that hasn't yet begun. Except she doesn't. She lies still, watching the stars, reading what's left of the world, drawing comfort from the continued existence of something that disappeared a millennia ago. Most mornings she's gone before he wakes. He runs into the dawn, searching. He knows he will only find her if she allows it. He has long since stopped believing that he is the one doing the finding. Sometimes he runs for an hour, sometimes three. Always he finds her standing still, watching the wind, watching the light in the trees, waiting for the world to tilt her forward. Do you think they will read truth into our bodies after we're gone? She asks him. When they found Viking graves, they read them as men, because all those swords and axes, what else could they be? And yet they could have read the truth in the lie of the bones, a pelvis, a femur. We were there. We were always there. He has run half the day. He is angry, not because she left before him, but because he wasn't there to protect her from all he has seen. Who, he demands, who will there be left to find us? She is silent then. Silent and sad. He has murdered the truth-tellers and left her with only the promise of a silent eternity. He stays awake all night listening to her breath curl in the smoke of the fire, and yet he sees neither she nor the stars depart. She leaves him a pack of biscuits wrapped in greaseproof paper and tied with red and white string. Has anyone here ever actually seen a zombie? <laughs> yeah, you haven't, have you? You feel like you have. Like, if you saw one in a lineup, you'd know them immediately. But when was the last time you were ever actually face-to-face -face with a real zombie? Of course, we hear about them all the time, right? Somebody always knows somebody whose father was in the zombie business and was there when something terrible happened to somebody else. Eight liters of blood, I tell you, and still we couldn't save him. Eight liters! Eight liters! <laughs> hey, don't, don't get me wrong. I mean... I want them to be real. I do. We need zombies to be real. It's an odd thing, that. We need them to be real because otherwise, what was all this for? I think about that a lot, you know? It keeps me up at night. What if things are not as bad as we've been led to believe? What if the things that we're afraid of don't actually exist? What does that say about the world, huh? That you believe that somebody might have told you there were zombies outside waiting to eat your brain just to stop you from looking out the window. I mean, to be honest, it's hard to really know what to be afraid of anymore. The list just keeps growing and how do you even prioritize? Do you ration them out? Zombie Monday, Alien Wednesday, maybe keep Saturdays free for the plague. To be clear, I, I do believe in zombies, and yes, I'm afraid of them, but I am more afraid of the people who want to weaponize our fears. I mean, these are crazy times, right? <laughs> love, fear, and zombies. Love and fear, fear and love, love and zombies. <laughs> I mean, not loving zombies, of course, because that would just be weird, but um, here's something else I think about a lot, right? Is love real? Or is it just another snake oil panacea sold to the masses as a remedy for our collective pain? Also,
What if they keep telling us we're broken just so we keep grasping for the ultimate cure? She slips her bare foot in amongst the coals. He's three, maybe four hours gone. She takes off her other shoe and rubs the soles of her feet together until they are both blackened with loss. She watches the coals until she knows the last ember is gone. That first week, she sleeps in the fork of a tree, waiting. Halfway through the second, she picks a lock, and in a garage, hidden behind a dusty Porsche, she discovers a tent, a camping stove, and a tarpaulin. She slides them into a cardboard box with the handle of a broom, and then pushes the box into the yard. She's not fool enough to enter a plague house through the front. The doors are marked for a reason, but there are always safe spaces. You just need more courage than the average looter, and a scientist's eye for disease. People stopped reading long before the words ran out. No one wanted to know what was coming or how bad it would be. But she already knew what was coming. She just wanted to know what mask it would wear. She waits three sunsets before she lays her hand upon the tent. Even then, even knowing that the sun has baked it clean, she falls asleep with her hands tucked under her arms, her face buried deep in her scarf. Wrapped around herself, she discovers she has forgotten how to dream. And for a time, she is grateful. She sleeps without dreams for a month, and then another. She drowns herself so deeply in sleep that at first she doesn't notice when the dream reappears. It sits in the shadows, listening for her. An empty room waiting to be filled. When finally she notices, she runs her hands across its walls, seeking out the stories that have been buried in the stones, whispered tales of all the things worth searching for, like water and love, sometimes both at once. She wakes with the dream woven into her hair and her boots already laced to her feet. Of course, what do any of us really know about love? Oh, <laughs> I know. You expect me to have all the answers, don't you? I thought I had all the answers. We, we all did. Oh, we thought we were so smart. We thought we knew everything there was to know about love. Books, movies, songs, all laid out there for the world to see. Got to the point where it seemed like there was nothing new to say about the subject, right? Eyelashes, brushing cheeks, hands, touching, fifty shades of whatever that was. And we were all locked up together for so many months, and everything changed. We weren't so smart after that. There was so much we didn't know about our partners. About ourselves. We thought that love was fireflies and rainbows. And suddenly we realize that sometimes love is just a good book and a comfortable mattress where we're left to stretch out alone. We were led to believe that love was flowers and candles and we wondered why we craved neither candles nor flowers but just the simple act of being held. We were told to seek out a fine suit and fancy heels in which we might dance through the ages when what we really wanted was a comfortable sweater to grow old in with sleeves wide enough for a second hand to reach through. We believed that love 
was the masthead Odysseus gripped on his decade-long journey home and realized that love was actually the pillow that Penelope reached for in the darkness to curl into her belly as she wept with longing for the touch of his skin. Because we don't remember in decades. We remember in seconds. We hold on to tiny fractions of the whole. The snatch of music swelling, bold enough to fill a forest. The bench on a deserted street at midnight, swimming in a pool of light. The shadow of a hand on a window as the taxi pulls. seconds, a gesture, a glance, a gasp. Crows sit on sagging power lines, watching her through the door frame, waiting. He vomits on the heat-baked tarmac and the birds take flight. He wraps his shirt so tight around his face he gasps. Still, the stench of rotting bodies coats his tongue. You're late, she says. Her mask hangs beneath her chin. I expected you on Tuesday. It rained Tuesday, he says. He'd watched it fall through the bars. They let him out of prison on Wednesday. Because of the rain, they made him wait until his 52nd Wednesday. Prison is the one place where the days still have names. She points to the box of water on the shelf high above them. You can't reach it on your own, she says. I tried to tell them that we could do it together. They killed each other for 12 bottles of water. She pulls a knife out of her boot and holds it out to him. There are wells in the mountains, she says. Ten days walk away. There's a map in my bag. Help me or kill me. He stares at the knife in her hand. I know about the wells, he says. You talk about them in your sleep. For the first time, she hesitates. Then the words tumble out. I waited for you. I always waited. You left biscuits, he says, and string. To eat until I got back, she shouts. And people always need string. I made a mistake, he says. Yes, I heard. They wouldn't let me visit you in prison. Did they tell you I was there? I meant about the string. Oh. You came to the prison? She leans down and grips a pair of ankles. I can't lift these last three on my own. A groan leaks from the body. And then it is silent. I came to the prison, she says, twice. Together they swing, once, twice. The body lands, then the next, a third. She climbs deliberately, placing her feet. He follows in her footsteps, again and again. They slip twice, start over twice, stabilize, climb again. She reaches for his hand, threading her fingers through his and she wonders if he remembers the splinter. She places one foot on his knee, one on his shoulder, finds her balance. She glances down and he smiles what is at once the satisfied smile of someone who has created a ladder by climbing over the bodies of 20 people who murdered each other out of greed and desperation and fear in order to reach what they thought might be the very last box of water to be found. And at the same time, it is the smile of someone who has made the simple choice not to be alone. And she thinks that maybe this is what love is. Just one choice after another, one act of forgiveness, one act of remembering, choosing to wait one more day. A splinter, a biscuit, a piece of string. And she thinks that maybe, perhaps this is that thing, the thing you thought was a one-off, a first-time thing, 
that thing that made you fall in love in the first place. And she smiles back. Then she slides her fingers over the edge of the box and... And when finally they fall, they fall together. And that's the last of them. Oh yeah, I suppose so. Not bad for a Thursday, all things considering. What? Oh yeah, yeah, you can go ahead and turn them off. I'm done. He breathes in the smell of her, over and over and over, trying to find the origin of the cloying stench of death she is wrapped in. He has burned her clothes, cut them in desperation from her body. He bathed her in running water, then spent a precious liter on her face and hands, because you never know what died upstream. He has scraped the death from her skin with a ferocity he would never have believed himself capable of because right now it occurs to him that maybe love is something you have to fight for with every fiber of your being. Except right now he doesn't know exactly what it is that he's fighting, he just knows that he can still smell it in her. Death, loneliness, and something that might be cat piss, but he can't be sure. She's naked. It's awkward. Give me your knife, she says. He stumbles at the sound of her voice. Her knife. He has to fold her fingers around the hilt. Is it still murder if you are holding the blade that sinks into your own heart? She works methodically, cutting away at his hair. She holds it to his face. The smell. It's not me. He recoils, repelled and triumphant. How many, she asks. Nine. Two baths. One broke when we fell. It's a good number, she says. Not a dozen, but still. Four and a half each. He looks away. Her fingers brush his face. Nine. Nine, he repeats. He pulls a blue glass bottle out of his bag. Nine and a half. She reaches into hers. Ten.